Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and I am super excited to bring you my interview with Philip Dormant. He is Director of Product Development at Treaty Oak Distilling. I really wanted to sit down with him because there's a lot going on at Treaty Oak Distilling, and, and I knew he would have a lot of answers. Also, I wanted to learn more about whiskey, the history of whiskey, what makes a bourbon, what makes a rye. He goes into depth. In the middle of this interview, he goes really into depth about all those different things. And I think you'll walk away from this with a better understanding of the differences, what makes up specific things, even what makes up Canadian whiskey, but also have a better appreciation for whiskey as well as what Treaty Oak does. I can go on and on and on in this introduction because there's a lot <laughs> in this interview. Look in the notes below, look in the companion blog for links, but we go over a lot of different things and also check their social media for their hours because at different times it could be they could be open Friday through Sunday they could have expanded hours or they can contract those hours back down to that it all depends on how things are going with COVID but we talk about all their different products however the main thing that he wants people to know is they should visit the ranch which is the 26 acre property they have Alice's restaurant which is barbecue and live fire, which has draft cocktails there. They have a beer program that's just on property. They have wine on property. You can get hand sanitizer. They've moved into old fashions. They have a thing called a day drinker. They have a gin and tonic. They're having a citrus version of that. The whole ready to drink world, I guess, is expanding rapidly. So they're jumping into that. But I think overall, you're going to really enjoy listening to Phil talk about everything that they do and why they do it, and how he, through his journey, has come to this. It includes music, it includes moonshine. I can't thank him enough for taking the time to share all these different things and to share his story and his point of view. And I know that you are going to really enjoy this. And I'm also excited that they're a sponsor of the Kevin's Barbecue Joints YouTube show and podcast. It's great to be tied to great people. I have a website at kevinsbbqjoints.com. Check it out. Links to all the podcasts, all the YouTube stuff. Interesting news about barbecue joints. Uh, collections of different things. I'm doing lots of different write-ups. I'm adding a lot of fresh content that I hope you guys enjoy. I'm on all the social media at Kevin's BBQ Joints. If you're digging these, please subscribe. That way you don't miss out. We've got over 200 interviews and also barbecue joint tours, sausage making facilities, lots of cool stuff. But in the end, stay safe, enjoy this, and check out treatyoakdistilling.com. What wine are you, are you at? Yeah, it's uh, my friends at Purton House Cellars. They're in uh, Stonewall, Texas. Okay, how far away is that from Treaty Oak? It's about 45 minutes. Out here, if you go if you go west, it becomes wine country. There's just it's insane. 290, the highway runs through here, and it's just oh, that's so cool. wineries on on both sides. It's become just a really a really strong uh, industry out here. Okay, so that's where it is. I've always wondered where that wine region is. I've I've been I've lived in Texas for a year, but I never I went to Dripping Springs, but never went west of it. Dripping Springs is kind of the gateway to the hill country. And so once you start going further west, the hills get a little bigger, and it just becomes mostly agriculture. And it, it was originally all it was originally all peaches. This was a oh. a peach area. Seems like wine and grapes are a little more profitable and also uh, a little easier to manage. Do people still farm for peaches out there? For sure. There's, uh, I mean, I'm on the way here. I may pass eight or nine different orchards. Okay, but, so it's, uh, it's it's still it's still prevalent, but it's definitely becoming more wine country than peach country. Gotcha. Texas has changed a lot, like in the, even in the last five years. Oh, for for sure. It, every every year, it's like it's hard to keep track. I, I always like have a number in my head of how many distillers there are in the state but every time i say it i feel like it's outdated same with even los angeles there's a bunch it's not it's prevalent because of zoning and things but let's go back i want to get your history a little bit how are you doing today i'm good i'm yeah. good just came off of a good long vacation was up camping in montana in that area oh, so nice. feeling fresh yeah just because covid we're not uh we're not distilling at the moment, so I, it was a, a rare opportunity to take a, a, a little bit of a longer vacation. Once the stills are running, I, I, I can't take a very long time time off from them. This must have been your first long vacation in a long time. <laughs> yep, I haven't taken three weeks off. Besides having like Christmas break, I haven't taken <laughs> yeah, three weeks true. off in one one period of time since I started almost seven years ago. So. Oh, wow. Where in Montana were you? Man, I was everywhere. I went to Wyoming, Montana, both the Dakotas, Idaho. Oh, that's awesome. New Mexico, 
Utah, all over. That is killer. How was like? Do what was it weird traveling these places or people like? Do you see a difference? Like, are people wearing masks? People not wearing masks? Like the attitude is. I was just curious with the cold. Oh thing. no, that's that's a good point. It was it was fascinating to see like what areas really we're putting efforts into controlling uh, the spread and other areas that were just didn't care one <laughs> bit. Uh, it was like New Mexico, you saw no masks. <laughs> Colorado, like Boulder, they're Boulder was so intense. Every everybody had masks on. I could see that. And then once you, once you got up, I mean Montana and the Dakotas have very few cases. So that's true. Got up there and it, and it was like, I was at a I was at a bar and there was a band playing and people were <laughs> dancing and and hugging and sharing drinks. It was like, whoa, this is what life used to be yeah, like. Yeah, the old days, like yeah, do the early yeah, early two thousand twenty. Yeah. It's become the old. It's become the old days. It is really weird. It's weird to think that that how much has changed in the last five or six months. And my 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 nephew is going to uh, to the university. I think it's the University of Montana. Oh no, Montana State University in Bozeman. Did you go through Bozeman at all? Okay, yeah. Uh huh. I did. Yeah. Is it a cool place? I was just curious. It is. Yeah. I have a friend that lives just like 15 miles north of Yellowstone. Okay. So I, I stayed with her, and then Bozeman's not far from there. Okay. Oh, cool. So he'll be close to Yellowstone. Yeah. He, he's he's literally 15 miles north of there. So that like, is oh, you're that's looking, awesome. You're looking at the... Ri- the range of the Yellowstone. It was wow. It was spectacular. That's really cool. Well, how long have you how long have you lived in Texas? Did you grow up in Texas? Yep, I'm born and raised Dripping Springs. Oh wow, so Dripping Springs too. Yep, it's funny. I uh, I grew up 12 minutes west of uh, west of Treaty Oak on Fitchview, the same road that Treaty Oak is on, and now <laughs> I live 10 minutes east of of Treaty Oak on Fitchview. So I've uh, spent most of my life on the road. Wow. Have you, did you live anywhere else? Uh Uh-huh. I did school in North Carolina and and, and then I lived in Nashville for a good long while uh, doing music work and then eventually moseyed on home and haven't haven't even thought about moving out since. <laughs> That's really cool. Like the Nashville's on my list of places to potentially move. I want to probably move to Texas, move back to Texas. But I, is like that? You in North Carolina? I used to go to North Carolina like three times a year for business. It's definitely interesting parts of the country. The really cool parts of the country. Yeah, I, I love both those states. I got a lot of really good friends, but Texas, Texas is home. And Texas is special. It's very special. Yeah. Did you go to school for anything that you're doing right now? Not at all. <laughs> How'd you get into it? I went to school for uh, for soccer at the end of the day. I I played oh, that's I played cool. collegiate ball for for a few years, but that's not a sustainable thing. And got into the music business. My dad's a professional musician. I grew up around it all my life. Huh. I started doing. I, I I finished my degree was in music business. So managed some bands. Did a lot of live live broadcasted radio shows, and just through all that, you you just get so associated with local brands of beer. For sure. And I just kind of found myself. That was one of my favorite parts about being on the road was just trying local brew, and somehow along the way. I got back to Texas, and I knew a guy in North Carolina that was making moonshine uh, <laughs> up in the up in the hills, and uh, just just wet or just east of uh, Asheville. Okay. So went up there and lived with him for a winter, and learned how to make moonshine in a shed, and was like, <laughs> man, was I, I like. <laughs> what was I, that I like? like? I like. Uh, not very safe, but uh, You're the but I mean the same. The same concepts apply. Mm-hmm. It's the really the same thing. I just work on better equipment that's safer and can make high, better quality products and a lot more products. I went back to Texas after that, was moonshining at home. Mm-hmm. And then th- right around the same period, Treaty Oak was moving from North Austin to, uh, to Dripping Springs, okay. where they're at now. And I linked up with uh, Daniel Barnes, the owner, yeah. and got a job building fences, uh, just getting the property up and running and eventually started distilling and then now I, I run the the whole the, the whole development program. So I build I build all the the products and also I, I have my pulse or I, I have the pulse on uh, the bourbon and the gins that we're producing and how we're how we're producing them. Already it's a cool story and it's an interesting story. It's like an interesting path that you would never you probably would have never thought that you'd be where you are right now, but whoever thinks they are, oh, still. Exactly. And I, I think that's one of the unique things about Treaty Oak, just as a whole, is 
we all come from a, a place where none of us had a background in distilling. We all just kind of found a passion for it and set our minds to, to doing it. And so we, we come with a di- very different approach. Like we don't have preconceived notions or traditions that we brought into the distillery. We came with just ambition and curiosity. And with that, we really developed the unique products that we make just because we don't have those preconceived notions of how to make bourbon and how to make gin. So you're actually paving your own way and creating your own style. Exactly. And with that, definitely comes uh, a lot of failures and and trial and errors that don't work out well. We won't go into any details. No, that makes sense, though. It does make sense. (laughs) At this point, I've been with them for almost seven years, and a lot of the guys in the story have been there for as long, if not longer than me. So we, we, we've we developed our uh, our understanding of it at this point. What was it like seven years ago? What what, what products did you guys have? So rum, rum was our flagship. Okay, uh, I know rum. That. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of people still in Texas know us as a rum distillery. Back then we were doing still the white rum. We aged that rum. We had a vodka called Starlight Vodka. We oh. had a Graham's Texas Tea. It was a a tea vodka, huh. we had our Waterloo gin, and we had just started distilling whiskey and putting it back. We didn't have any of uh, any bourbon that we made ourselves. We did uh, we did have red-handed bourbon, which was uh, a source bourbon, just because we, we knew we eventually wanted to become a bourbon distiller, and that'd be our, our primary mark. We just weren't there. We didn't have the proper equipment, or we didn't have the, the financial backing to really make bourbon properly, so... We just we took the route of it's called red handed bourbon because yeah, that's, that's yeah we that's we sourced it we like red handed we we stole, stole it, it. We, stole <laughs> stole red, it. We, got, we got caught red handed <laughs> but like we're sourcing from really unique like unique places we're getting bourbon that we really love and we're being more tastemakers than distillers which is a refreshing pivot because we're so used to being the people producing the stuff we still have that line you still have that line now is that is that something that you guys went and you kind of shaped the profile there like is is that something like how does it how does that work that when you work with when you not outsource but when you use a different distillery it's more like we we look for really special juice that's unique and something that we just we we love as a distillery and we want to showcase we are constantly getting different samples in from uh, distillers all over the country and in Canada as well. Uh, like our, our red-handed rye, is a, we brought it in as a 10-year-old rye and uh, from an old defunct distillery, the, the Shinley Distillery. Oh. So we, we found it. It was really unique because it was kind of counter to the current trend of really high rye. So like mm. a lot of ryes you see on the market these days are like, 95 percent rye and there's just this big push for really bold spicy ryes and we found this 53 percent rye so it's still still considered rye but a lot closer to a bourbon mm-hmm. but aged in a in a, a used barrel so it's straw colored it's very light but it's just really unique it's got so many green apple tart fresh oh, without a doubt bell peppered qualities and we we love it and we we as soon as we tasted it we were like we want we want to bring this in and this this fits under our profile great because it's unique are they still making it for you or are you guys making it no 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 so it's it, it's not contract distillation it's simply we we will bring in samples like well somebody's selling it and we oh, okay. we taste it we love it and then we bring it in as barrels as barrels gotcha and okay. And then we do single barrel picks, but we also have our standard red-handed rye, which is this juice. Mm-hmm. And once it's gone, it's gone. The distillery's defunct. It's not unlike how people do in, like in the wine business too. How people bring in juice from different growers exactly. and different. Okay, so the, oh, so once this once this rye is gone, it's gone. Yep, there's no more. <laughs> and then, but there, there's there's excite there's excitement in that too because for sure we'll have another rye that we're really stoked about that has totally different qualities to it, but it's still something that we we have pride in selling and saying, sure. hey, we found this really good stuff. I hope you love it as much as we do. That's cool. So can you explain what the what a rye is to people, and can you explain what the difference is bourbon-wise, like bourbon to scotch, just kind of like a like not a four-hour <laughs> seminar, but kind of explain for people. Because right, right, right. there's a lot of people listening that are like, I like bourbon, but I don't know why I like it, and I like scotch, but I... And like, what's a rye? And I, my friend likes rye, but I don't know why I, why he likes rye. You have to back up to so just what is whiskey. Exactly true. So true, true. 
Right. So whiskey is simply a fermented grain that has been distilled. The most common four grains are corn, wheat, rye, and barley. Okay. The early whiskeys were made in Ireland and Scotland, and those were all made solely with uh, barley. Mm-hmm. So Irish, they use some malted, they use some unmalted barley with their malted barley. But okay. like, say if you if you see a single malt whiskey, that is typically coming from Scotland and single malt. So it means it only has malted barley in it. Okay. So that's the only grain used. Where you you move over here to North America, where corn grows and and wheat grows really well. The the Scottish settlers and the Irish settlers that were in the Northeast and eventually moved to Kentucky, they had all this grain that was they couldn't use. They had already sold. They had already made their cornmeal, and they had all this left of grain that they couldn't use, and they didn't want it to spoil. So, the that's what became the whiskey okay. was they. They took those grains, they milled it into a pow- or into a more of a flour. They uh, fermented it with water and yeast, and then that eventually became beer. And then they put that in the still, and then that's how they made whiskey. So, whiskey is really just whatever grains are around historically. Okay, this is awesome. No, thank you so much, Phil. Whiskeys with whatever's plentiful around them. Historically, and historically. like yeah, like one of the early spirits of the United States was rye. Because rye is such a hardy grain. All in Pennsylvania and Maryland, there was, I mean, before bourbon, it was rye was the the spirit of, of the United States. Oh, interesting. And obviously, that was at a very different time. Yeah. At this point, we've we've defined spirits a lot more. So at this point, bourbon has quite a few requirements. Uh, it has to be at least fifty one percent corn. Okay. It has it has to uh, be aged in new charred white oak barrels. Okay. So it has to be a brand new barrel that has never touched any other spirit or any other product. Um, that's what gives bourbon so much color, and you get a lot of the, like the char, like oak tannins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's okay, because interesting. It's required. Okay. It's 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 required to be a new barrel, and like that's why there's so much vanilla. In, and caramels and bourbon opposed to say like your single malts mm-hmm. and your Irish whiskeys. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Just because, because it's just that brand new fresh virgin oak. And actually, because we have to go through so many barrels, we sell all of our barrels. Not we treaty oak, but we as the United States sells almost all of our barrels to uh, to Scotland and Ireland. That's what I thought. Their, their product because they don't. They don't have a requirement for it to be uh, a, a new new oak. They actually prefer just from their profile to be a used barrel. So those those barrels have this great life cycle, and a lot of times they eventually get down to the Caribbean to make rum. Interesting. So <laughs> besides that, um, it has to be made in the United States. Bourbon cannot be made outside of mm-hmm. uh, the U.S. It's got an Appalachian of origin. It's got to be distilled lower than 80% alcohol. So the higher that you distill um, your proof, so proof is just uh, 40% alcohol is 80 proof. Just, just double, double the percent alcohol and you get the proof. Oh, gotcha. But okay. the higher you get up, the higher you get up, it gets closer to vodka, which is neither good nor bad. But you, the more ethanol there is and the higher proof it is, the, the more you lose the base integral qualities mm. of your raw raw materials so by distilling it less than 80 percent alcohol that means that you're holding the integrity of the grains it's going to taste like the corn like the, the wheat right the barley so most most bourbons out there i'd say 90 percent of bourbons on the market are corn obviously 51 percent or more mm-hmm. and then rye and then then malted barley. Our bourbon is a little bit different. We choose a, a wheat a wheat instead of a rye. Okay. Why is that? We I think wheat does better in the Texas heat. It it can it, it, it ages better with just our really high temperatures. For sure. Because the sometimes those really spicy qualities of a rye can create a lot of just like intensity and heat for the mouthfeel and just on the palate. 
whenever you're drinking it and while it's aging in Texas. So, so we also love the qualities wheat gives beyond that. Uh, wheat is known for being a lot of stone fruit notes, a lot of like dark cherry qualities, and it's got a silkier mouthfeel, mm -hmm. which is part of that, that heat, uh, combating that heat. And that's just, those are the bourbons that we love. Think of uh, Maker's Mark, Weller's, Pappy. Those are all uh, historically famous uh, weeded bourbons. And they're historically famous, like very popular in Texas too. Everyone had the night. When I, when I lived there, a lot of people were drinking Maker's or Weller's. And I had never even heard of Weller's like growing up in Los Angeles. I don't oh, know. really? Yeah, just oh, it yeah, wasn't, well, this wasn't yeah. it, I guess it just depends on where you live. When you were first drinking, were you drinking bourbons um, or beer? I drank more I drink more beer Same. and wine. Yeah. Um, I didn't get into spirits till a little bit later. I, I remember like being in college and we would have whiskey and dark nights. I was like right when I was starting <laughs> to dive into uh, into into the whiskey world. It was, at, at that point, I, I was excited about Canadian clubs. So it's uh, my palate has changed quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I think so. That was, isn't it really sweet? From what I remember, didn't people mix it with? seven like cc and seven or the people is that what did people would put seven up like mix it with seven up or something weird like that or yeah seagrams and seven oh, i mean there's yeah. canadian whiskey gets a lot of hate um just because they have some pretty ambiguous uh legislation around what is and isn't whiskey but that's interesting canadian whiskey is absolutely delicious and there's some there's some folks doing it really well and people don't know very much about it and no. i i i love i love chatting about it because People think of Crown Royal and Canadian Club and Seagrams, which are all blended whiskey. So they don't, they don't have like a lot of times they blend grain neutral spirits, so basically vodka in there. Oh, and a lot of times they'll add caramel coloring and different like vanillins and <laughs> apple flavors. <laughs> and 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 they don't have to they don't have to disclose that. But it's unfortunate that that is what Canadian whiskey is known for because. There's some distilleries that do really good stuff, and they do it differently than us historically because they do instead of making a mash bill. So mm -hmm. like, you you always hear people talking about, oh, what's the mash bill of that bourbon? And so that's like our so our ghost hill bourbon is 57% corn, 32% wheat, 11% malted barley. So instead of putting all those grains, cooking and fermenting them and distilling them uh, with together. They actually will distill 100% corn, 100% wheat, 100% rye, 100% malted barley, put them in barrels, blend them, and then after it's all been aged and, and finished, then they blend it together. Wow. So they take a very different approach to uh, American bourbon with the exact same grains. And there's there's some there's some really good juice out there. Almost so. scientific. And it's interesting you call it juice. It's like it's... I. I didn't know like that. It sounds like a like an inside term, but I, I'm sure I'm sure a lot of people that know it that, or that make their own call it juice. But and it makes sense that it's called juice, isn't that? Is that what they call uh, for grapes? Do they call it like the juice too, or they call it something else? Yeah, they call it juice. But yeah. we we uh, it just makes it acceptable to drink for breakfast, right? <laughs> if you call it juice. When you were at seven years ago, when you guys what, were you starting to get really excited about what you're doing, and were people starting to gravitate towards the red handed and like is that something like what was were there was there a point where you realized okay this is something that with barns like that you guys all realized okay this is something good work. yeah so uh we actually we we were we were planning on dropping the whole brand because we want i mean obviously we're more excited about what we make from scratch and it's more yeah. of our expression and we we're we we're planning on dropping it and then it was just doing so well in the market and it was just getting a lot of steam so we decided that we might as well keep it and really like push the same concept that i've already kind of outlined yeah, yeah. just like we, we want to be producers as well as tastemakers so in that light we decided to continue it on so let's talk about ghost Hill though you you broke you broke down a little bit of what how you make it but is that and that's that one's 100 percent you guys right yep yep that is uh all texas grain we make we we bring it in we work closely with the farmers uh, we've we worked to find the exact varieties of grain of like corn and wheat that we prefer. Mm -hmm. Gets distilled, aged, bottled, it, everything but everything but sold. <laughs> so it, it's sold all over the country. Yeah, everything is done in house. You bottle everything in house? Yep. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, okay. But Ghost Hill's your baby. Ghost Hill is what we is near and dear to our heart, and that's 
but we're always pushing and trying to make a little bit better. I love Ghost Hill. That's I think that's my favorite. But now that you've talked so much about the rye, I really want to like think about the rye while I'm drinking it, as opposed to not like just it's like enjoy it, but also think about what you've discussed here about the rye that makes it so, so special. But I the Ghost Hill is phenomenal. Like so, for can we talk about the three different ones and then you guys also and then the rum was the rum gone and then it came back or has you have, have you always had the rum we went through a rebrand i guess maybe two years ago it's hard it's hard to keep track of time that's okay. time but yeah. no. <laughs> maybe two years ago we, we brought in some investors because we wanted to move to be a national brand mm -hmm. and with that came a total makeover we we rebranded everything new packaging and in that it was the hardest decision we had to make but we chose to uh to pull the rum from our category okay. or from our portfolio, um, both the aged and the white, just because whenever you're going, whenever you're a national brand, you have people out there singing the gospel of it. Uh, it's really hard to have a concise message to the consumer that makes sense. Um, when you have so many products. So we we step back and was like, all right, well, what what do we feel like we do the best? What do we feel like? we have the most ingenuity and creativity with, and we decided those two were our gins and our bourbons and our gotcha. whiskeys. So in that, in that light, we chose to, to pull it out. Um, but we are actually releasing, or it's becoming part of the portfolio again, shortly, just, just the age rum. We, we, we got some new packaging, packaging for it. And, uh, we've, we've released a few like single barrels, but, it's going to be a mainstay that's beyond just the ranch. Probably in the next five, six months would be my oh, guess. Oh, wow. Okay. Because that's where I had seen it. I had seen it pop up like in your social media and everything. I had seen that that rum was back and I thought, well, that, I didn't really understand that. And that, that does make sense. If, but you have, to, you have to bring it out properly because people know you how they know you now. Exactly. It brings me to a point like the ranch is a really great – I call it our Petri dish because there's so many products that we can – have on site that we're sure. we're tasting people on and and like our bottle shop and we we can get just get so much great feedback from the consumer like perfect and to, to understand kind of preferences and what people are really excited about and we we definitely expand on that and just finding trends and so like the rum is something that people are constantly like oh we love the rum like bring it back <laughs> and there are different different like heirloom grains that we've been working with. And we'll we'll do oh, only rad. on ra on site ranch release, and when things grow legs, then we can consider uh, taking it off property and uh, putting it into distribution. But it's just a great space. It's, it's a great safe space where people are excited to come yeah. to the property and actually taste stuff they can't get anywhere else. But at the same time, it gives us really good feedback. So well, let's talk a little bit about the property. I talked to Scott about it, and he. What he's overjoyed, he loves me. It's like heaven on earth to Scott. But to discuss, like, for people that may not, might not listen to that interview, what's it like visiting and when will you guys start distilling again, too? Do you have any idea? Yeah, I expect we've been, we've been talking about getting together or getting going again uh, in August. August. Okay. I guess it's been about March, April, May. It's been wow. over good. three months off. Good amount so, of time. I mean, yep, yeah, which, which is tough because. We're not making bourbon for right now. We're making bourbon from four, four years from now. For sure. So uh, you kind of we have to account for the fact that those barrels we're not producing might mean a shortage down the road. So right now, I believe we're open six days a week. Okay. And then that's the restaurant and cocktails. A lot of like we don't do tours right now. Yeah, I was gonna say tours there, are off. Right and our like shaken and stirred like high end cocktails in one of our bars. We're not doing that just because it's a closed space that's indoors so we have the great fortune of buying we have 26 acres right now yeah so we're able to keep everybody outside and still have a whole lot of people and do it safely so we're we're uh, we're very fortunate opposed to a lot of distillers that are struggling through this because they only have like one indoor space mm -hmm. so we are able to handle a lot of people and still serve all that barbecue that scott's been making yeah, that's per that is perfect. So let's so let's say like COVID's over or it's during a kind of a normal time of life. You, when you come in, you can get food, but you could also you had what? Did you have two bars at one point? Yeah, so we have the restaurant, mm -hmm. 
which is our all of our our barbecue and uh, all of our food. But we have uh, cocktails there as well, um, all draft cocktails. Okay. So we get we get so many people on a if if it's a peak if it's a peak beautiful weekend on a Saturday we might have. 1200 people there at one wow. one <laughs> moment in time so that's amazing we can't shake and stir that many cocktails so in the restaurant we have dra- a draft cocktail system so it's all still fresh juice and like really nice high quality cocktails but it's, we can just yeah. we can get them out quickly them out quicker, and yeah. then we have we have what we call our rick house which is we store some barrels in there but it's mostly a bar it's like a open air barn that we serve all of our cocktails in so those same draft cocktails. We also have uh, our cocktail lab, or I don't remember, I don't remember what we're calling it right. Now. We've changed <laughs> the name of it so many times, but it's like our high-end shaken and stirred cocktails. Gotcha. You can fit maybe 50 people in there, and in there we put a lot of emphasis on techniques of making r- really nice cocktails that are unique in our conversation pieces. And there you sit down at the bar. You talk. You talk to the bartender. You, you. There's a lot more education. That's great. In that room than, than the other spots where like, yeah, if you want to just go get a drink and go hang out with friends, you can do that. Or if you really want to dive in deep on what these spirits are and how you make these cocktails, you belly up to the bar and then. So once once life gets back closer to normal, that's when that'll be open. Yep. But I mean, we we have a beer program. Uh, our, our brewer Jason Stein makes some really great beer. So that's for the property only. We have a wine program. Yeah, we have a wine program. So we we aren't making any wine, but we uh, we work closely with wineries right around this area that I'm in right now, oh. the Stonewall area. Oh, that's so cool. Yep. So we bring in our own blends and and sell sell them just because we get so many people. We want to cater to everybody. Not everybody wants to drink spirits and yeah. we want to have an environment where everybody's welcome and can get what they want. That's amazing. And I was telling Scott, and I was just kind of joking. I'm like, you guys need to eventually. I know it's a dangerous, it's a, it's a dangerous combination of all those things. <laughs> so you need to have eventually lodging on site because in that way, but I guess there's places close by that you could stay. If you uh, to. Yeah. There's so many Airbnbs and hotels. We, uh, we've, we've considered it. Um, there, there might be cottages in our future. Um, that's just a whole nother ball game. And right now we're still working on making the best bird. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a, that's a can, different animal so. unto itself. That's a whole hospitality right. animal right. That, that needs to be done. Right. And you guys seems like everything you guys do, you want to do right. Exactly. Yeah. We don't, we don't rush into anything. Wow. And that's like how, so, but how has it been during this COVID time? Has it felt weird to not, cause you, were you the one giving tours too? No, I, I I work Monday through Friday. I, oh, gotcha. Every once in a while, if we have like uh, if we have like a specialty event, I'll, I'll come in and do a tour. But or, but for the most part, I'm Monday through Friday. It's been it's been bizarre. I mean, we we're all hap- happiest when the stills are running. That's all what we want to be doing. So, mm-hmm. anytime the stills aren't running, there's a certain there's a certain uh, blanket around the <laughs> distillery. We had to shift entirely to sanitizer. Mm-hmm. We kind of saw that trend coming. So fortunately, we had a, a lot of grain neutral spirit uh, in inventory. And so it was it's it was it was the Wild West. Every day there is different there is different statements being released yeah. by the CDC or the FDA or TTB, all these government agencies. So we're just it's funny because it's like we're sitting here and like. We get this statement and we're like, all right, well, we need to get this denaturing agent. <laughs> um, so, like, I'm running over I'm running over here calling all these people and all these other distilleries are doing the same thing. It, was, it, it kind of felt like a rat race there uh-huh. for a while. I can and, imagine. Because there, so there were so many, shortage, there were so many shortages mm-hmm. of, these, of a lot of these items. So, just trying to be the first to get to these items and being really proactive and being forward-thinking. Um, it was a it was a stressful time. It really mm-hmm. was and like even down to like the packaging, like bottles. It was really hard to get bottles at that time. Well, that makes sense. So it was just this crazy time of like having to be quick on your feet and doing everything you can just to to get the sanitizer out. And it, it worked. I mean, it, it it was a perfect compromise because like thinking about what distilleries can do for the community. For sure, this was definitely the best thing i mean we we make booze for a living we make something that's sanitary 
So it's the, it's the best thing we could be providing. But at the same time, we've all, I mean, we donate a lot of product, but at the same time, we're able to sell mm -hmm. this sanitizer that allows us to stay flow, allows us to be still employed mm -hmm. and still be there and uh, staying afloat. So it was really a, a, a great compromise and a, a great place to be for distillers to make sanitizer. And it just shows too, like how, how, um, tenacious people can be and how like the ingenuity of like Americans and, and people in general. And these, like the fact that people switched over to doing like sanitizer or, or like Ford switched over to making ventilators. It, it's just during this time, it's such a weird, we're going to look back on this and just marvel at like how terrible it was, but also how amazing it was. But it's right. I mean, we, we sold product. I mean, you can find our stuff in whole foods. NASA had purchased, some sanitizer. Did they? So there's, there's a lot. <laughs> yep, NASA, NASA's got some of our. We, I need to get that email address because we are always debating random questions. It'd it be a, good. It'd be good to have NASA, <laughs> NASA on our email list of, <laughs> of questions. That would be we're, awesome. Because we're arguing about boiling water, boiling water in space. So it'd be good to get NASA's feedback on our, on our, uh, on our debate. That would be really, really fun. It'd be cool to share that information too, like that you. And it would be cool to have like that Trudy Oak um, connection to NASA. People be like, "How do they have this interesting connection to NASA?" And they have someone's ear because that's that. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. What do you think? Yep. What's, what's your theory? Uh, there's no oxygen, so I, I think you would really struggle to boil water. Mm -hmm. But they could also, so, and then also too, I, I but they're able to solder, right? Can they? Weld in space? Oh, we didn't, we didn't bring that up. Uh, they have to be able to do I don't, that. I don't know. Maybe maybe in like the controlled space station that that they like pump oxygen. Yeah, in that there. they create an, an, an you don't want to mess with a whole bunch of stuff in space. Well, what? So then, what? Like to kind of summarize this, is there anything that we haven't discussed that you'd want people to know about Treaty Oak? Or and I know it's available, and I'll I'll be showing pictures of product and stuff, and I. I have product, I have photos of, of everything, but is there something specific about Treaty Oak that people should know? Well, we're de we're uh, we're releasing a few products right now. That oh yeah, isn't there a about. Yeah, so we finalized uh, our old fashioned recipe and we batched it and got it into bottles this week. We're selling it for the first time at the property today. Yeah, today. Oh, cool. And Great. so that's gonna be that's gonna be a big push for us, and we you can buy it online as well. Okay. Um, here shortly. We're about we're about to release a day drinker, so hmm. just following that trend of beer moving to a session like a more sessionable, sessionable product, something that you can drink numerous ones, opposed to just something really strong and either really hoppy Hoppier, or really malty. Yeah. We're releasing uh, what we call our, our day drinker, so it's a, a 40% alcohol. Um, it's our same bourbon, but it's aged a little bit younger, so it's got a lot of those bright, fresh notes to it. Uh. Um, but it being a lower proof, it's, it's something that you can, you can drink out at a picnic or on the river opposed to our other product that is a higher proof mm -hmm. and you, you might, it might be just a little too hot to really enjoy and you want to kind of pace yourself as something that's a little more sessionable. Oh, that's, so yeah, that's cool. That's going to be released probably sometime this summer into the fall. On the gin front, we are releasing some gin and tonics. So, kind of hopping on that, the that the RTD, the ready to drink world, is just absolutely exploding. Okay. Um, so, like all the hard seltzer stuff, and we wanted to get into that market, but at the same time, still keep it very much tree oak and ourselves. And so, doing gin and tonics was a great way. Um, so it has our Waterloo number nine gin in it, but it's 5% alcohol, 100 calories. So low on the calorie wow. front, but, uh, still has all those qualities of the, the gin and tonic that you expect, but something that you can, you can pound one after the other and not worry about, uh, getting off the boat or driving home. So, oh, that is, that's cool too. Wow. That's awesome. That's going to be, uh, it's a traditional gin and tonic, and then we have a citrus one as well. So smart. So smart. That's awesome. Anything else new coming up? We got a Navy Strength gin coming out that's uh, on the other side of it. <laughs> the so <laughs> Navy Strength is a really high, high ABV gin that typically shares qualities of, like, 
So you'll have like a, you'll rig a gin and you'll have your navy strength and it'll share qualities of that you have your flagship, but it'll be much higher proof, which a lot of a lot of people like for cocktails because essentially it just means it has less water in it. Gotcha. So it's it has more flavor, it's stronger, which works great in cocktails. Wow. So is that something like summer or fall too? I think we're still mapping out exactly a, when our release date is going to be, but somewhere somewhere in that range. I don't want I don't want to disappoint you, give you any, <laughs> anything that doesn't end up being true. So well, they could at least people can just pay somewhere attention somewhere in the su- summer fall. Gotcha. So if they pay attention to social media, yep. they can check up and see when this exactly. Uh, yep, yep, yeah. We're we'll, we'll shout loud and do jumping jacks and tell everybody what's going on. So do you guys have a newsletter too? Yeah, uh, it's called Pursuit of the Curious. Mm-hmm. I I bet if you go online, you can figure out. If you go to our website triopasilling.com, I'm sure you could very quickly navigate how to <laughs> how to subscribe to it. Exactly. But uh, I I don't know. I'm, yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm a bit. I'm a bit slow when it comes to technology. <laughs> you don't have to be. That's a that's someone else's job. But it's it's yeah. So then yeah. There's the, the that the social media is probably the best place. Like follow you on Instagram, follow you on uh, on Facebook. I think Twitter. I think you guys have Twitter, but I don't know if it's. I think those are the the two main ones are Facebook and Instagram right now that have that because it's it's more visual. We're always releasing single barrels and unique stuff uh, on the whiskey front. Socials help with that, but I mean. Being at the property is really the best That's way the goal. to understand to, to understand who Treaty Oak is and what we're doing and just the forward thinking and our, our willingness to step outside of the box and tradition and just uh, uh, ask, ask those questions and make, make the products that do ask those questions. Exactly. Well, that's, and that's what I try so, to push is for people to visit you guys on property because I, cause it's, it's a lot more special than – like it's nice if, if you live out of state to be able to purchase your, your – your bourbons and whiskeys, you'd be able to purchase them at like their local BevMo or Total Wine or whatever. But going on property, I, that's what that's my goal is to the next time I'm in Texas, I, I plan to spend a couple of days there because it looks fantastic. This looks like a great experience. Yeah. Well, we, we we're also in uh, California. Uh, Florida is a great market for mm-hmm. us. We're in Illinois, Tennessee. So there's quite a few places mm-hmm. that we're starting to have a. A, a, a pretty good following and uh and a place where you can find our spirits without ordering them online oh yeah yeah that's true but they can order online too off your website and there, there's also a bunch of clothing and swag yep. and cool stuff to end it what about the maple syrup is that your oh that was that yours your idea or whose idea was the maple i think that was daniel the owner he uh i don't know how that dude that dude doesn't sleep at all he all he, <laughs> that dude's brain is moving all the time and it's it's a full-time job just uh making all the ideas that he has come to fruition and he but he he's ex- extremely uh well read and educated and has tons of great ideas so I, i'm pretty sure the maple syrup was one of his we barely that stuff that stuff's good that's so good i just i have a bottle that i just i just drink it i mean i, I just drink maple syrup in general for <laughs> dessert just drink it like a drink it like pop i put it on ice cream and it was so good so good yeah yeah i love that stuff but olive oil we do a bunch, bunch of stuff that's rad. Well, thank you, Phil, for taking the time and especially for sharing. I, I think that I gained a lot of knowledge. I know a lot of people will gain a lot of knowledge from this. Education is the other side of it. I mean, I I learned from so many people and got it took me a lot of people to get to where I am right now. So it's just it's part of it is the more the more you learn, the more you want to teach. So. For sure. Well, thank you for taking the time and thank you for doing what you're doing and stay safe and I can't wait to visit once this fog lifts a little bit more. Yep, sounds good. Well, it was so nice to meet you and so chat nice with to meet you. you. Hopefully, hey. I'll get to meet you in person one day. You will for sure, most definitely. Oh, without a doubt. But hopefully, it'll be sooner than later.